Welcome to Fruity Knitting. This is episode 70. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. And we're back in our Offenbach lounge room after our travels in Wales. Yeah, and it, for the last couple of days, it's really been snowing here. It's a beautiful landscape and it's definitely the bleak midwinter. So I wanted to tell you one of my favourite poems. In the bleak midwinter, frosty wind made moan. Earth stood hard as iron, water like a stone. Snow has fallen, snow on snow, snow on snow, in the bleak midwinter long ago. That is a great little simple poem by Christina Rossetti. And yesterday when I was walking in the woods, the landscape was just white and frigid and icy. And that poem just really brings up the melancholy feeling that I feel when I'm in that beautiful landscape. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a stark difference between summer and winter here. Yeah. It's yeah. great. Anyway, moving on, we have two fantastic interviews for you in this episode. When we were in Shetland, we visited the Jamesons of Shetland Woolen Mill again, but this time we got to interview Elaine and her son, Gary Jamieson. So Jamieson's of Shetland is a fifth generation family run business. So it's great to hear their story, especially told in their lovely Shetland accents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And the spin drift is probably their best known yarn. It's sold in yarn stores all around the world and it's a fantastic yarn for knitting Fair Isle or stranded knitting with. And it's also very inexpensive. So many of you will actually be f very familiar with this yarn company, but we're really excited that you'll get to know the family in a more personal way through this interview because it really is a great interview. Yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> And we've got another interview with the UK designer, Di Gilpin, who we did a major feature on back in episode 55. So if you haven't seen that episode yet, go back and watch it. Um, we really cover a lot of um, Di Gilpin's work throughout her career. And so it's a really good one to watch. Today, she's joining us to talk about the Scottish Gansey jumper, which is another one of her passions. So that's a lot of fun. And she also shows us one of her latest, or she's working on a special design and she shows and talks about it. And this special design is especially for Andrew. Yeah, <laughs> Which, yeah you heard that correctly. And of course, I am extremely flattered. Um, we'll hear, hear more about that later in the show. Uh, we also have new releases featuring Natasha Hornby from Moonstruck Knits. We've got updates on our own projects. Bit of work happened there. And Andrea, you're starting a new craft. Yes, I'm starting a new craft. So don't fear, knitting is still my first and main passion. Good. I was going to say only passion, but oh. <laughs> it's not my only passion. Good. Yeah. So there's Jack too, isn't there? <laughs> there's Jack yeah. too, and Madeline. <laughs> so anyway, I am very excited because I finally committed myself to learn how to crochet properly. I first got the itch to crochet properly when I saw how the UK designer Marie Wallen combines crochet and knit fabric together in a lot of her garment designs. And for example, if you have a look at this picture here, this is a design of hers called Lovage and you can see that she's sewn on a strip of crocheted lace on the sleeves and the crocheted lace is using a slightly darker shade of the oatmeal yarn that the sleeves are knitted in and I just love how the knitted fabric and the crochet lace just look so good together. It doesn't immediately stand out as being crochet, in fact you could almost think it's just a complicated twisted stitch pattern. Anyway, I'm a complete beginner at crochet but I've taken on a really daring project. I'm going to tackle this really beautiful heirloom crocheted blanket called Bohemian Blooms and it's by Jane Crowfoot. It comes in a kit and it's using a mixture of Rowan yarns, all of which I've used before. So before you think I've gone completely mad and have become way too ambitious for myself, just listen to my plan. It's going to be a very slow project. So um, like I said, in the, in the kit you get all of these yarns. There's, um, they're all Rowan and they're all DK weight, but you do have different fibre blends, which is really exciting. So you've got the felted tweed and you've got the soft yak, which is cotton and yak and baby merino silk, which is baby merino and silk. And you've got a full cotton blend, which is a summer light. So they're really beautiful yarns for a start. So you get all of these lovely colours, but the different fibre blends is going to make the, the blanket have a different textural look as well. You get a whole lot of beading and you get this really beautiful book. So the first half of the book 
Jane talks about the inspiration behind the design and then she goes on to show you how to slowly work through the whole project. So <laughs> there are 41 crocheted pieces in this blanket and there's about eight or nine different designs. The designs are all different shapes and sizes and for each design you have to do I think between four to six identical repeats. And the, these designs are presented in um, order of skill levels. So the techniques that are used are built on each other and become progressively more complicated as you go along. So for example, here, you start off with this very simple striped border panel. So there's going to be four of these. I've just started. This isn't finished yet. So this is a very simple uh, double crochet which is the UK term or single crochet striped panel and you've got four of them to do and Jane suggests that you do all four together because what's interesting is they all have to match every design piece is a different shape and size it's like a big jigsaw puzzle so we have to make sure that all of my four border pieces are exactly the same length and width so that in the end when I sew it all together it, it actually lays the flat which yeah. is what you want but it also has to match the bits on the inside though yes yeah, yeah. anyway so you, you start off for example on a very simple panel and then by the end you're really doing very fancy motives using beading color changes lots of textural and decorative stitches and also layered crochet so it's pretty darn exciting <laughs> <laughs> But like I said, it's a very slow project. I'll be, t I'll be taking it, you know, very slow. Probably take me at least a year to do. This is your second blanket project, isn't it? No, I've never done a blanket. You did a blanket very early, your leaves. Oh, yes. It's yeah. a, when I was six years old. Yeah, so. That's probably why I've never done one since. <laughs> but this is exciting. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, the inspiration for the design. It's, it's called Bohemian Blooms because it's inspired by the Bloomsbury Group, which were a group of painters and writers and intellectuals and artists who lived in the Bloomsbury District in London in the first half of the 20th century. But during the war years, a lot of them were conscientious objectors, so they moved out to the country and they were working on the food farms. And Vanessa Bell, who is Virginia Woolf's sister, she, she was an artist, and together with Duncan Grant, who was also an artist, they moved out to the country to a country farmhouse in Sussex called Charleston Farmhouse. And that then became the new centre for the Bloomsbury Group. And over the next 60 years, this uh, uh, farmhouse was decorated with amazing artwork, but also with really fantastic furnishings and textiles. And the farmhouse also had a beautiful walled English garden, which became quite famous. It's interesting because Jane says that her colour palette was inspired by the painter Stanley Spencer, who was also a Bloomsbury member, and he used very chalky shades of brown and terracotta and pink and grey, and you can see that in the design. And the design itself really evokes the English gardens and countryside that was famous in this Charleston farmhouse. So because I'm a complete beginner, even on this very simple striped border panel, I had a steep learning curve. Here it is here. <laughs> So, but let me tell you a couple of the things that I've learned because it is quite fun to be learning new things. The first thing I learned is that the gauge when you're doing crochet is just as important as the gauge when you're doing knitting. So the very first thing I had to do, obviously, is to do a chain and doing a chain and crochet is just like casting on stitches on a knitting needle. But my stitch gauge had to be 10 stitches for 5 centimeters and 22 rows for 10 centimeters. And so I actually had to unpick and redo my 10 stitch chain quite a few times until I got it to, to measure exactly 5 centimeters and to look neat. So that was actually a surprise for me. Was that a bit humbling for <laughs> it you? It was guys? humbling and a slow start. <laughs> <laughs> but I got there in the end. And so this panel is meant to be 5 centimeters wide and it, it, it is. And I think my gauge is looking fairly consistent throughout, which is good. The other thing I learned about gauge with crochet is that it, to help um, you maintain a good consistent gauge, you need to hold your crochet hook parallel 
to your to the crochet work so you've got to work consistently holding it parallel if for instance and you may not see this in good detail but you often have just two stitches on your crochet hook and if you are working with your the, the point of your crochet hook tending to go upwards the second stitch is always going to be looser and that'll make your gauge slowly bigger and and looser likewise if you're working tending it to be like this with the, the tip pointing down the second stitch here is always going to be tighter and you'll gradually get a tighter gauge so that's why it's important to to make sure that you're always working parallel exactly parallel so that was fun to find out that seems to make sense yeah it does but sometimes you just you don't think of it automatically yeah the other thing is you can see that this has got four different colors in it two blue and two gray and that is actually not as simple as it might immediately look what you can do is carry the two blue up the sides that's what um, Jane says so you can carry these two blue yarns up the sides as floats because once you finish this panel you're going to uh, crochet a bordered edge on both sides and, and that edge will, will cover up those floats so that's no problem but she does suggest that these two greyish looking yarns that you actually cut and then later on weave in all the ends and I thought well I don't like doing that as you know I do a lot of stranded knitting and I have a technique when I'm knitting where I'm weaving in the end of the old yarn and the end of the new yarn as I knit along so that when I finished a garment even if it's got 20 different colors in it I never have a whole lot of ends to weave in I have no ends to weave in I just sort of trim them off so I thought surely you can do the same with crochet so what I did with these gray yarns is I laid the if I just undo this if I laid the end of the yarn the old yarn and the end of the new yarn along the top of the crochet work and then I just double crocheted over so just worked over the top of it holding those two uh, yarn ends over the top and that worked that has automatically woven them all in so you can see all of these itty bitty bits coming out on the side I just have to trim them off I haven't trimmed them yet because before I trim them off and when I and before I do the border panels I just want to be able to tighten them or loosen them to make sure the stitches are really even so but that's worked really well but you could see how many ends I would have to weave in if I didn't do that so I don't know if that is a crochet technique that is typically used in crochet or not but it does seem to really do the trick so that's my progress into the world of crochet and I'll keep you updated. <laughs> it's very exciting though, yeah. something new. Um, coming up next is our interview with Di Gilpin and one of the things we're going to hear about here is or are the herring girls and these were young women who would travel up and down the UK coast following the herring fishing fleets. Um, they were very often young single women and they often worked in groups of three, gutting, salting and then packing the herrings into big barrels where they would be further transported. This work gave these women a huge amount of freedom and independence and it also meant that they were travelling. They yeah. had to travel for the work. And they also knitted and as they travelled from village to village they would swap um, knitting patterns, so yeah. the little knitting designs and that's how these things spread. Yeah. Di Gilpin is really passionate about the Gansey and she's actually done a research project and gathered the patterns and also the stories behind the patterns for the Gansey all up and down the, the Scottish coast. So this is a really fascinating in interview. I think it's a really great way to look at history. Yeah. So enjoy this. Knitting. I'm here with Di Gilpin in Larrick in, during the Shetland Wool Week and many of you will remember our earlier interview with Di Gilpin back in episode 55. 
Di Gilpin is a UK knitwear designer who creates very beautiful hand-knitted couture collections for the catwalk and various fashion houses, but she also has a really deep knowledge in traditional knitting techniques. And today, she's going to teach us more about the Scottish Gansey which is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> we did touch on that subject in our previous interview, but it's really great to have her here in person so that we can go into more depth. So Di, welcome and thanks for joining us again. It's great to see you in person. Oh, thank you, Andrea. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing being here, obviously on Shetland yeah. and being with you and yeah. with Andrew. So it's really exciting. Yeah. yeah, thank you for asking me. Totally our pleasure and the viewers' pleasure yeah. too. Great. So I thought before we get into some of the construction details and stitch patterns that are used in the Gansey that you might just give us a little bit of background information or a bit of history sure. on, the, on the Scottish Gansey. And one thing that I thought of and, and used to confuse me is that sometimes you hear different names, like you'll mm -hmm. hear Gansey and Guernsey and there's mm -hmm. also Jersey. So maybe you could clarify that sure. a bit. Sure. Well, yeah, there is a lot of confusion. Um, the Guernsey comes particularly from the Channel Islands. And um, it's, there's a long history of Guernsey knitting, going back about 500 years, and, you know, ending up with a machine knit Guernsey, which people kind of see now and recognise as a, as a sailor's jumper. It's very simple, um, no embellishments really, apart from a really lovely kind of slightly pico cast on edge, classic garter stitch bottom and a little rib. But those actually are not... Ganses in the sense that we know them here in Scotland or on the northeast coast of um, Yorkshire, where I'm from, or from Cornwall. The construction is completely different. Um, in the Gansey or Gainsey, and there is a Gallic word which could be could have, have, have created Gansey, which means yarn of the sea, and it's a Norwegian word as well, which is very similar. These are constructed um, in the round and seamlessly. And the um, Guernsey is knitted flat and machine knitted. So, I mean, okay. there's an instantly a complete difference between the two. The traditional Guernsey, the ones that I've looked at through the Murray Firth Partnership Guernsey project, um, we looked at a lot of Guernseys from Aberdeen up to Wick in the very north of the country. And we recorded lots of patterns. A lot of these were very tiny patterns and um, the whole garment was knitted, you know, kind of fully patterned, very dense, very tight. As you move around the coast, the patterns do change. You do see a difference. For example, in Cornwall, they were knitted commercially for a period in the 18th century, 19th century, even before the advent of machine made wool like the Poppleton's five ply Gansey wool which is a worsted spun very very dense and with all the fibers flowing in one direction and usually colored navy. Um, before the advent of that in Cornwall and in Yorkshire and in in Scotland they would have been spinning their own yarns and using those to make the Gansey then, of course, they wouldn't necessarily have been navy. They'd have been in the natural colours of the sheep that they had to hand. Um, there was a huge knitting industry in, you know, the British Isles from the 13th century, really. And the Ganses were just part of that whole picture. But they were very refined. And I think it's really interesting to look at the, the, at the historical importance of them because the depth of stitch and the complexity of the designs shows that it's a much older tradition than a lot of people would actually give it credit for. So it's a fascinating area. You know, each area had its own little patterns, but over the years, those have changed and evolved as, as you know, the advent of books and like Gladys Thompson's history of Gansey knitting in the 50s people started looking and um, sharing patterns around the coast. And also the herring girls, who were so important in the passing of those traditions down the coast, they'd come from the West Niles, they'd come over to Aberdeen, and they'd travel with the herring fleet, hundreds of boats moving south with the shoals of herring. And they would pick up ideas and, you know, sailors from different areas would see a different pattern and you know what it's like as a knitter. You see mm. a new pattern 
and you think, wow, I love that. It might be the flag pattern or it might be the tree of life. And suddenly you want to put it in your mm. your own Gansey and as part of your do story. do a variation on it. And, yeah. do, and do your own variation. And apparently lots of villages, certainly in the Moray Firth area, there would be one knitter in a village who had special talent in knitting. And those would be the more ornate Ganses, obviously, rather than the simpler versions. Mm. Yeah. That's so interesting. And we actually have a couple of great books here too, uh, which I've recently discovered. So there's a lot been written about yes. the Gansey, isn't mm-hmm. there? So mm-hmm. just um, we did talk about the construction in our previous interview, but just mm-hmm. go over it again. Can you just summarise some of the typical constructions that are very unique to Gansey? Sure. I mean, I think one of the crucial things is that it is seamless. And so you cast on and, you know, some areas they did a double wool cast on, but not all. And a lot of areas just used a cable cast on. And then they would knit in the round, creating a lovely little side seam, yeah, which they could use as a counting mechanism to know where they were within the pattern. That was a pearl stitch, wasn't it? A pearl it? stitch yeah. running up each side. And um, obviously they were knitting on straight pins, often with a sheath or a, um, you know, a belt. And they would go down to even like maybe a 1.5 millimetre needle, which, as you know, is incredibly fine. It's like a bicycle spoke. It is incredible. <laughs> Actually, during the war, they had to, um, there was a shortage of metal and they used to use things like that to knit with. Yeah. So going back to side seams... Um, these were actually a really nice device because they would knit up to the start of the gusset and use that side seam to create their increases on each side of it. So it, it's beautifully incorporated as they made one right, made one left and created their little gusset. Then they would divide and um, knit the front and then knit the back and then put them back together, seam it or incorporate a shoulder strap okay. into the yeah. construction from the seam from the the um sleeve um and then they'd make the gusset out as they knitted the sleeve out the gusset makes ah. the makes it very wearable it means that you can stretch your arm up and around without ripping any seams or you know creating tension in the garment so it made a really good fit for an active person yeah and then they would make the necks. And some areas, they like to have a little gusset at the neck so that they would put in a, a, a tiny little gusset out and then the neck so that it sat away from here Okay. because they'd have an undergarment underneath. Other areas, they liked it very tight to the neck, even with a little button on the side. And other areas, like I've seen a photograph in Cornwall, where there was a trend for very high high ribbed necks which they could turn over like a polo or, neck or like a polo neck yeah or actually pull it right up to the nose so i mean there's fascinatingly interesting small changes in different areas yeah. depending on what the fishermen needed different types of fishing down in cornwall different types of fishing in the north sea yeah. so they'd have different requirements and of course they'd have much shorter sleeves and um so they didn't get caught in the rigging or in the hooks from the, you know, when they were fishing or the nets and get pulled overboard. Mm. So very dense stitches, very small needles, um, five ply worsted yarns eventually after the use of, of um, hand spun. And usually a plainer sweater for the everyday fishing and then a more complicated, you know, beautiful sweater, which they call their marriage sweater or their... Um, Sunday best. And that would be because of the stitch patterns, wouldn't it? Yes. They're all traditional knit and pearl stitch patterns that were used, weren't they? They are. And did you find variations when you were looking at those moray uh, Gansey yes. sweaters between Fife and further up north or from the east side and the west yes. side? I can see differences. Yeah. You know, having looked at collections from Fife where I live, from the Anstruther Fisheries Museum, where I've got access to the collection there, I see differences, distinct differences between there, the Moray Coast, then down to Yorkshire, where I grew up, Mm. and then round to Cornwall. And um, there's also big differences with the Dutch Ganses, which are Mm. much simpler. 
Um, they haven't got as much detail and complexity in them. So yes, I do see differences. And obviously you see patterns traveling, mm. but there are some very distinct patterns, like one that I really absolutely love is a musician's pattern from Cornwall, which is very lyrical. Um, it's a very flowing, very beautiful pattern. Whereas others, in the fleet patterns in Scotland, they're often very regimented and very graphic in okay. the way that they look yeah. when they're yeah. knitted. So you've got some patterns here. Yes. Are they typically ones that are incorporated into the the Guernseys? And well, tell yes. us a bit about them, what they're sure. called. And... So I've, I've brought with me um, some samples of this. This one in particular is a pair of leggings and it has a gusset, which is really exciting. But we've got the print of the hoof pattern, which you can see running here and here on this design as well. And this is a lacework print of the hoof. And you find this on the Eriske Ganses. Eriske is a tiny island in the Outer Hebrides. And they have a unique Ganzi, a white Ganzi, um, which was knitted with lace panels. Now, you wouldn't get any self-respecting fisherman <laughs> to go out in wearing lace. a lace jumper, apart from on Eriske. But that tradition is a marriage Ganzi. It's a very special Ganzi. Sunday best. Sunday best. That's where you'll see the lace um, print of the hoof. And now, it's only a few little it's holes. It's a few tiny little holes. It's only decent. <laughs> but you can knit it without. So you find in the Yorkshire Ganses the print of the hoof without the lace. Okay. What that signified was that your boat, your fishing happened from a bay without a harbour. So the boats would be taken out with a horse and cart. In fact, my father actually used to do this with some of the fishermen in Filey. They'd take the boat on a trailer out with a horse across the strand and then the boat would go into the, into the sea. So the fishermen um, from that area would have that knitted into their ganses. Okay, wow. And what about, um, I can see here, there's two different versions of the Tree of Life. This, yes, the Tree of Life, which obviously is a, is a, is kind of a, it's a good luck symbol. Okay. So you've got the open work, which you get in Eriske, but then the closed work, which you've got here, which you get on most other ganses, and that pattern is found all over the place it's mm. a very universal mm. symbol and we've also got here the rope there's a lot of rigging a lot of things that identify with the sea or with the sailing because these patterns were developed during you know the age of sail so you'd have the rigging you'd maybe have harbour steps um, which is like a little ladder and that indicated that your boat came out of a place with a harbour okay um and then you get the lovely little joining patterns which run up and down between each of the designs. And these are so fascinating. I think probably the most exciting part of a Gansey um, because each individual knitter made up their own little joining patterns. And they're just borders, aren't they? They're borders, they're yeah. edges. But you might have like little moss stitches or, you know, two-stitch ribs um, yeah. or you might get... Um, a kind of twist and it, you know there might be three stitches five stitches seven stitches and that accommodated the size of the garment and that's where you played with the maths to create the right size for the person that you're okay. making it for. okay okay that's great and i'm just seeing this here this stitch pattern is in this it's the same diamond shape yes. what's mm. that oh this is really lovely this is the um church window and it's a filled in diamond although they do come in other um, in other forms they can sometimes have diamond within or just be plain and these represent the church windows on the coast in fife where, where I, I come from, there's five fishing villages in a row and each of them has got its own special church and they're usually in a landmark position so that if you're sailing past, you'd be able to identify which village it is. Okay. And each church window has got its own shape. So at night, when they were lit, you'd be able to know, ah, that's Pitt and Weem, it's not St Monan's, I need to wait for the next village. So they acted as landmarks, they were very, very important to sailors you know, when you're getting your bearings and you, if you're sailing, you need to tack in sharply to yeah, get into a harbour. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that's where that comes from. And then the tiny little one up here, the um, it's like the fishing nets. And that's that we found that in Inverness. 
So that's very much an Inverness pattern. Okay. The tiny little diamonds. Yeah. Although you do see it in Cornwall as well, but specifically from Inverness. Yeah. So many beautiful stories behind these patterns, isn't it? Yeah, you can, it's amazing. That's the real, the real fun of it is to you see the pattern. They're yes. beautiful in themselves, but then when you know what they were used for, what they're connected to, that just gives it yes. life, doesn't it? It meaning. does. It yeah. does. It's amazing. That's beautiful. Well, Di, it's actually been really interesting to to learn more about this very famous historical garment but actually we're going to move back to the present day now because Di has been working on something very exciting a new project and you're going to tell us about it now aren't you yeah I'm really excited Andrea for a few months I've been putting some ideas together and some stories and I've been working on a design for Andrew yes can yes. you believe it <laughs> which is really exciting and it'll have it incorporates some Gansey pattern some textured patterns and the whole idea of Andrew and Andrea's journey to Shetland um, which I think is really exciting. We are completely over the moon about this we couldn't believe it but it's it's super exciting so we're now going to just see what she's put together and how she's incorporated these these thoughts and, and yeah. ideas and, mm -hmm. and her designing process you'll see yes. in action. Yes great. So the inspiration Andrea came from an amazing piece of artwork that I had to make a few years ago and um, I was exploring I was asked to explore Ian Stevens, who's a poet and writer from the West Niles, his journey, I'd made him a Gansey to sail his boat in. And um, he asked me to record his log of his sailing um, from Stornoway, right the way around the north of Scotland and down to St Andrews in a piece of knitting. His log was online. So from setting off, and he showed me his sea charts, which I love, love sea charts. And he showed me his route. And then he'd log up online where he was and what was going on and all of that sort of thing. So I knitted this piece to reflect the sea and the nature of the sea in his journeys. And it goes through, you know, calmer waters and then more difficult waters. And running through it is the line of his boat as he's sailing. As he's tacking, yeah. As he's tacking through these waters. Yeah. Pendleton Firth is a really difficult stretch of water to sail through. And... The knitting only got this far because in the Pentland Firth, an enormous gale blew up and he lost the mast. Oh. And he ha he was shipwrecked on Orkney and he had to take the bus to St Andrews. So I'm waiting to finish this project. So I just woke up in the middle of the night and I thought, this is where the project is going to end. It's going to end in a garment for Andrew. <laughs> That's so, <cool. laughs> so it's going to be your journey around Scotland, but also your journey over the Pentland Firth and out to Shetland. Yeah. I wanted to incorporate some Gansey knitting and I wanted to incorporate the textured cable knitting so that you have the surface of the sea and you have the stories incorporated in it. And because I know Andrea likes a challenge. Yes. <laughs> there's some intarsia in this. And Good. There's the line of the the boat sailing through the waters yeah. in a different colour going through it. So I thought it'd be a really nice challenge. Um, so I came up with, this is a little sampler, which shows the cabling at the sides. And this will change as th throughout the garment and the sleeves to show difficult waters, smoother waters. And then in the centre, there'll be a whole series of Gansey patterns framed in an argyle diamond pattern because I thought you know the argyle is a beautiful style of knitting and I wanted to have a little reflection of that in the story that we're creating so what I do is I first of all create my sample and then I get attention from it and in this case we're working with two different tensions we're working with the cable pattern and we're working with the flat Gansey pattern which is just stitch work. I'm going to use the cable pattern to create tension and to create shape and form within the design mm -hmm. to get, as we were talking earlier about, a modern man's shaped jumper, which is very flattering and really interesting and nice to wear. So we'll, I'll be working on that, on the different tensions and how to incorporate them. I'll be working on the measurements that you've given me from Andrew mm -hmm. to get a really good fit and I'm probably going to use set-in sleeves for this. Good. Um, and then we'll, 
the neck is open for discussion. <laughs> but it'd be quite nice to maybe use one of the traditional Gansey necks yeah. with the lovely little gussets yeah. here so that it just sits away and will be really nice and easy to wear. So those are the tensions. This is the drawing. And within the drawing, I've put lots of lovely Gansey patterns, which I'm going to choose or maybe even make up. For that, I'm going to put in this one here, which I particularly love. And there it is framed in the Argyle. This is the lobster pots, which I thought is, you know, a different style of, of fishing. I'm also going to put in the flags. It's one of my favourite patterns. All Gansey patterns are, you know, symmetrical. So you have your centre line and then on each side, it's always identical. And in this case, you've got the rows of flags with the rigging in the middle. And most sailing boats, when they went into a new harbour, they'd raise their flags to show their nationality, where they were from. So it's a very important kind of symbol. I'm also probably going to put in, which I think is really nice, the rigging which are a series of cables with, you know, running up with pearl stitches on each side. And all, also I'm going to put in the nets, which are here, which are the diamond shapes and form. And we might throw in a few church windows. And yes, definitely. Things that relate to definitely. different parts of, of Scotland. Yeah, that, so. that sounds totally brilliant. I'm very excited. It'll make a very interesting knit as well. It will, because you're working through all these different styles of knitting. And you're getting a very modern, contemporary look. Totally. With lovely satin sleeves yeah. and nice, long, slender arms yeah. in the fabric you know, the dark fabric, yeah. which will give you a nice slender look, yeah. I think. It'll be great. And uh, you also mentioned, so that we've got this diamond on the front and also that on the back. That will go to the back. Yeah. And the idea is that the patterns on the back will be different. Yes. <laughs> so which is great for a knitter. If we do it in that, using that as a traditional base fit, you can turn it round and wear it the other way. Yes. So you've got two different stories going on. Which, which is be, totally Gansey, isn't it? Because it's totally Gansey. do that. It's absolutely, they would do that. When it got worn on the front, they'd reverse it. And as you know, you know, if, if it got worn on the cuffs, they actually wouldn't even bother unravelling. They would just cut them off, pick up and knit down, mm. maybe in a different colour because the dye lots had all changed or the yarn had changed or mm. whatever. Um, so we're getting a little bit of that, you know, mm. Gansey history in there. Totally. And we can tell a different story on the back to the front. Yeah, it's great. And knitters love that. I mean, because they don't, I mean, personally, I knit sleeves differently. Yeah. So, I mean, to knit <laughs> two different, a back and a front differently. And it really also exciting. means you just get to, to experience more different Gansey patterns. Yes. And, and get exactly. to know them. So that's, exactly. that's very exciting. And we might even invent a few. Yes. Maybe a couple of Australian ones. Maybe a couple of Australian. <laughs> yes. Well, we've just got to get Andrew, he's behind the camera at the moment, we've got to get him on because he's complete, as you can imagine, he's over the moon to have... Di Gilpin designed him a, a jumper. I mean, can you believe it? <laughs> That's very sweet. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll just call very Andrew kind. over now. So absolutely, I'm totally flattered to be receiving this beautiful Aww. design from you. And it I just, think the story is absolutely Aww. beautiful That's because lovely. my family actually came from the area that you're living in now. In I, this is incredible. I didn't even know this. Yeah. And it just, it just, it came to me that this had to be your pattern. Yeah. Uh, it's and just so strange. Our, yeah. our understanding is that they were fishermen. So that is completely beautiful, completely suitable. And yeah, and we obviously have traveled across the globe. Yeah. Um, back in 1835, yeah. they traveled out to Australia. Amazing. So, and now we're back here in Shetland. <laughs> and you're going to have you your own much. Gansey. I'm going to have a beautiful Gansey. I'm very excited. Yay. About that. Well, thank Yay. you for Everyone watching for. us and, and, um, we, we got to hear a lot today, a lot more about the Gansey, but also to see how we've gone from a, talking about a very historic garment to a very modern garment, but yeah. with mm. all of these um, historical connotations so and connections. Yeah. So it's been great. It's been fantastic. Thank yeah. you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, so, so we'll exciting. say goodbye. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 So, Dales, how do you like being Di Gilpin's muse? Well, it's...
pretty big responsibility I've got there <laughs> in that role. Pretty flattering. I'm very flattered, very exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's cool. I'm excited to knit it. Di Gilpin uh, works a lot with fashion houses where she designs uh, special hand-knitted garments as part of their collection when they're putting them on the, on the runway. And she's very busy right now finishing off a collection for a fashion house and then straight after that she's going to finish this design for Andrew. So I should be able to start knitting it sometime in April. That'll be really exciting. Goody. Yeah. I need a new jumper. Yes, you do. <laughs> Dye is offering all Fruity Knitting patrons a 10% discount off all yarns, kits and patterns in her online store, which is really fantastic. Dye's Leyland yarn is made from Scottish lamb's wool and she also has another special yarn, which is a blend of Scottish lamb's wool and cashmere. So that's really special. Thank you very much to Dye. Yeah, and the colours are really beautiful, very unique shades of colours that blend very well together. So I'm going to give you an update now of my nightingale designed by Nora Gon, and it's uh, part of this book here which is the latest edition of, of the Pom Pom magazine. If you haven't seen our very last episode you've got to go back and watch it because there's two interviews in there, one with Megan Fernandez who is one of the co-founders of the magazine and the other one is with Nora Gon, who was the guest editor for this edition. And, and it's, they're really great interviews, but especially if you're going to knit one of these patterns, I think it's really inspiring to hear it, them talk about it. Yeah, it's good to have the extra background there. Yeah. So here we go. Here's my nightingale. I've done the front and the back pieces together. They've been blocked. I am really happy with it. I love the way it looks. Can you see this, this lovely... Uh, cable design here. I always knit my hair into the garment. <laughs> you can see it's just like a shield, the shape of it. It's very beautiful. So I'm very thrilled with it. Just get rid of the little ends. You might remember that in the last episode I talked about a lot of puckering happening here that I wasn't sure I was going to be able to get rid of. Well I have and so I'll tell you how I did it. Uh, both the, so it's the garment's knitted in pieces and bottom up, so I've completed the front and the back and I just soaked them both in water for about 30 minutes and then I just lay them flat. I didn't pin it all out, just laid them flat. But I did pin this section here where the cable crosses over. I really stretched those stitches so that the puckering would be, would, would lose, we'd lose the puckering underneath. So I'll show you a very close up picture of that. You can see where I've placed the two pins. Those stitches in between were really stretched wide and that seemed to really smooth out the puckering underneath. So hopefully they won't sort of spring back, you know, with a bit of memory to how they used to be. And the other thing is you can see that right there it's slightly uh, thinner, the cable is slightly thinner, but I don't think that matters. I still think it's, it's really beautiful. So there's the front piece. Here's the back piece, which is exactly the same except it's a little bit higher up here. You can see that motif comes up there, which is cute. So two beautiful pieces, very exciting. I'm going to wear this at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be one of my jumpers. And I've done one of the sleeves and the sleeve has got really interesting shaping on. So I have to show you about that. So I need your hands again, Andrew. Yes. So again, it's a set in sleeve knitted from the bottom up, what I'm going to, I'll show you how it looks here first. So it's a, it's a lovely elegant sleeve. You can see that the cuff, the ribbing on the cuff is really quite long and it's a combination of a two by two rib and a one by one rib where the single knit stitch is actually twisted and that pattern continues up the sleeve in a central, in a central panel and the two stitch ribbing actually gradually increases to become a wider panel of stocking stitch. So what the interesting part is the bell shape at the top. So while you're decreasing along here to form the bell shape, you're actually increasing in these central panels there like that. So the top of it is actually going to be quite wide. And then in your very last row, you decrease a lot of stitches at the same time as casting off. And that means you've got that, that kind of gathered bit at the top, right at the top of the sleeve cap, which is really beautiful. And so that'll sit on the sleeve like that, like a puffed sleeve, like a very Edwardian styled puffed sleeve. Yep. Yeah. So 
The yarn is Alistair Moore's Hebridean 3-ply in the colourway Pebble Beach. I'm thrilled with it. It's it's really interesting. It's very clever. This, this I, I'm really imp impressed by this sleeve. I mean, the pattern on the front and the back is obviously really spectacular, but this I find the interesting. Shape, the shaping, yeah. Yeah, just, and also because it's so simple, but it's still really elegant, you know, elegant yeah. and, and adds a, a real interest to the sleeve. So. Yeah. It's, it's a great design. Yeah. So, Andrew, what are you knitting? Yeah, of course. So, I am knitting on your hiking jacket. So, it's coming along. I can show you a bit more of what I've done later. But, um, first of all, I did want to show you the concept diagram that Andrea has hand-drawn to show how it should look when it's completed. Hopefully. Yep. <laughs> Yep, so I've completed the back. That was the first part that I did. If you could help me, please, Andrea. Yes. <laughs> Just hold it like this. You don't need to look at it. Okay. <laughs> so there's the back. It's pretty plain. Stocking stitch, bit of armhole shaping here, ribbing at the bottom. Um, that's finished, so that's really cool. We have the right front. Get it up the right way. So there's the right front, which is also complete. Um, and then we can start to see the features of the, the design. We, shall, I, shall I put it up against me? Yeah, do that. So in the end, we opted for a fairly simple wiggle cable down the sort of down the middle here. So that's really cool. I think it looks good and I think it's a nice placement. What we're going to have is um, an I-cord bind off at the very edge and then there'll be a zipper, which is really cool. We could do a really violently different color zipper, like bright orange yeah. or bright red. Yeah, a contrast zipper. That could be really cool. And then because I've got that double, I'm going to do the double over um, collar. I could do a stripe or something just on the inside of it. Yeah. That could be cool. There's breakthrough live <laughs> on international television. Yeah. We'll see. So that's the basic plan. Um, what else? Yeah, the, the cable, I've been doing the cable without the cable needle. And actually, if you go back, you may see me struggling a little bit sometimes. Um, it essentially works, but sometimes I have trouble getting the needle back in and splitting threads. So, but yeah, just... And sometimes you simply forget to Sometimes cable. I forget, yeah. <laughs> I'm just racing along so fast, they just go whizzing past and I have to go back, which... But I I've, think it's actually yeah. going... I'm quite happy now. I was, for a long time, I was worried about what cable I'd do, but I think that's just a nice, elegant good. wiggle. Yeah. So there'll yeah. be two wiggles it's, on either side of perhaps a violently coloured zipper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds cool. So I'm working on the, the second front. Oh, I pull my needle out. Working on the second front here, um, that's coming along all fine. I was thinking how we, at some point we figured out what proportion of the overall knitting the sleeves represent. It's quite a lot. Uh, they're surprisingly wide because the widest part of the, of the sleeve can be almost as wide as the back, almost. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you'll anyway. get there. Yeah, I mean I tried. Maybe I'll help you. I did consider pushing the idea of a hiking vest. No, <laughs> no. I'm not gonna win that one. and I'm the designer behind Moonstruck Knits. Uh, Andrea and Andrew asked me to tell you something about my latest pattern release, uh, which is for a shawl called Lune. And of course, I'm very, very happy to oblige. Uh, Lune's most prominent design features, in my opinion, are the horizontal and vertical mosaic bands. Um, and since mosaic is a slip stitch uh, color work technique, it tends to tighten your fabric a bit when you work it. Uh, that's because of the slipping of the stitches and uh, the floats. So I like to combine uh, mosaic knitting with um, stitch patterns that also have this feature. So for the, um, uh, the natural sections over here, I use the cluster stitch pattern, which Barbara Walker called star stitch. And I think they go really, really good together. Um, it almost gives the shawl a woven appearance, which I, I, really, uh, I really like. Um, I adore the mosaic technique. I've used it before. It's so much fun to do. It's easy. You only hold one strand at all times. And it produces these very beautiful, bands of high contrast uh, geometric uh, color 
Um, you could also work some texture into your mosaic, so I think the possibilities are endless. And for this show, um, knowing I wanted to use mosaic, uh, my challenge was for, to myself was that I wanted to use it um, horizontally and appearing vertically. Of course, you work it horizontally, so I had to come up with a construction of the shell to make uh, the mosaic appear vertical. So what I did was the following. I'll take it off so I can show you the construction. I hope it will be visible. What I did was I started the upper body of the shawl over here with only a few stitches. Then I work my way down um, in star stitch pattern doing mosaic and increasing to um, get this triangle shape. Um, at the center I started decreasing, ending with a few stitches over there. And after the upper body was finished, I picked up the stitches at the lower edge and started working down. I think this adds interest and also I'm not doing it really neatly like right now. You can see you can throw it on and it will look good. Inspiration behind this design. I always find it hard when people ask me uh, what my inspiration behind a certain design is because I see so many things. Um, we have our social media, I go to movies, I go to exhibitions. Um, I live in this uh, city of Amsterdam which also gives me a lot of visual input. So to pinpoint one inspiration source is all that were always hard for me. But I think this shawl would not look the way it does now if I hadn't been to Marrakesh last year. I was mesmerized with uh, all the beautiful textiles, the rugs, the, the, the towels, the garments even. And I think uh, that all trickled down and led um, in a way to this design. What is a, a very literal nod to, to, to beautiful Marrakesh are the tassels. Um, you see them everywhere, they are on the rugs, they are on the garments and um, I think they give this shawl just that little extra. If you don't like tassels, you can leave them off, it will look good anyway, but this in my opinion, gives it just a little more pizzazz. So I think that is the story behind Lune, and I hope you like it. Um, it was so nice to tell you about it. Thank you very much. So thank you, Natasha, so much for showing us your really stunning design. I think it's a super elegant design. Yeah. And like she said, the combination of the slip stitch and the star pattern from Barbara Borker's Stitch Dictionary, it really makes it a, a, a woven yeah, fabric that's texture. Yeah, that's a really cool effect, isn't yeah. it? And if you look on the project page and you just check out other people's versions of that design, you can see some really interesting colour combinations. And I actually thought that might be something that you could tackle one day. Yeah. Fairly soon. Yeah, I would certainly consider that. And I haven't, you know, done the one shawl, but that's quite a while ago. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I did want to mention Fruity Knitting patrons can receive a 20% discount off all of Natasha's self-published patterns in her Ravelry store. Yeah, Natasha is a super stylish woman and her designs are really gorgeous. Yeah, the jumper that she's wearing in that, um, in that presentation is also a recent design. It's called Dion and I think it is really groovy. Um, so enjoy looking through her store and thank you very much, Natasha. There's just so many interesting things to knit. Yeah. <laughs> So we want to thank all of our wonderful patrons again for continuing to finance the show. We really appreciate it. Like we said, our main goal for the first half of this year is to make sure that the workload is sustainable. And to do that, we'd really like to have Andrew working on the show full time with me. And that is would be a very exciting thing. We'd get to do a lot more. We'd even get to travel to more festivals, which would be brilliant. That's very doable if more of our regular viewers become patrons so if you're enjoying the show please do become a patron thank you yeah thank you also from me 
Coming up now is our interview with Elaine Jamison and her son Gary, both of Jamison's of Shetland. This is a really fun interview. We are sure you're going to enjoy it. Yeah. Oh, and we also want to announce that Elaine and Gary are offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 10% discount off everything in their online store. This includes their famous spin drift yarn, which is a jumper weight yarn. They've got DK and Aran weight and lace weight yarns in a huge variety of colors. I think there's 220 in total. But they also sell knitting needles and accessories and knitting belts. So if you've ever thought about trying out a knitting belt, this could be an opportunity for you. So thank you very much to Jamiesons of Shetland. Um, we've had a great time today, so thank you very much for being with us. And we'll be back in two weeks' time. Bye. Bye. Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm here on a very beautiful part of Shetland. It's very remote but very beautiful. Sandness is on the western coast of the mainland and to get here Andrew and I drove on a very long narrow windy road across moorlands which were studded with little lakes and freely uh, roaming Shetland sheep and some Shetland ponies. It was really atmospheric. <laughs> it felt like it really should be or it, it could easily be the set of the next Jane Eyre movie <laughs> that they make here. <laughs> and um, yeah, so Sandness is the home of the Jamiesons of Shetland Woolen Mill, which is the fifth generation family run business and whose yarn many of you already know and really love. And with me today is Elaine Jamieson. Hello. <laughs> and her son, Gary Jamieson. And they're going to share with us today the very interesting story of their family business. So I'm really thrilled to be here and I'm really um, happy that both of you are on Fruity Knitting. So thank you. Well, thank you for having <laughs> us. Yeah, it's good. good. So Jamiesons of Shetland started in the late 1890s and the ups and downs of your family business has um, is really like a mirror of the story of the, the wool industry and knitting in Shetland. So can you just um, tell us how your family business has evolved over the last 100 years or so and how you've actually managed to diversify and therefore survive? Okay, well, I'll have to try and cram in 100 <laughs> years here, but I'll give it a bash. Um, so in the early 19, 1890s, I should say, um, Robert Jameson, my great-great-grandfather, um, opened a small village shop here in Sanus, where we still are today. Um, and at that time, he would have been trading for... Uh, tea, sugar, that sort of uh, domestic goods that uh, crofters couldn't grow on their own lands um, for their hand-spun, hand-knitted, at-home garments. Um, they would have been anything from uh, fair isle sweaters to lace work, hats, uh, but also a lot of like underwear and that kind of thing. That was all wool back in those days. Um, and he would have been exporting those garments outside of Shetland. Um, and this was really a, a bit of a lifeline um, for the crofters because there wasn't really much money at that time yeah. in the islands. So people really were selling them to, to survive. Um, as that home produce started to decline, uh, Andrew, that would have been Robert's son, uh, started to buy in raw fleece um, and move that off to the mainland Scotland for processing. Uh, he would have been then taken yarns back to Shetland for um, hand knitting again at home to, uh, to export again off the island. So it was really just to keep that industry moving, uh, even though people weren't doing so much hand spinning at the time. Um, and then we kind of move along, that sort of moved along to the 1950s um, till 
Bertie, that was uh, Andrew's son, uh, <laughs> opened the first retail shop that we have uh, in, in Lerwick. Um, and that was really the start of the Jimison's knitwear brand. Um, and the main, of the main purposes of that shop was really to sell to local tourists. They would have been starting to come in at that time. Um, but also at the same time, the local wealth was increasing um, and people were, were, um, had more money in their pocket to buy nice things okay. for themselves. Yeah. Um, and that sort of continued on for about 10 years till we came into the 1960s um, and we were, we were still producing knitwear um, to order. And there really started to become a big demand for plain, uh, single-coloured uh, Shetland wool sweaters. Now again, the, sorry. Before yes. that, it was feral, was it? Well, we, it would have been would have been both really. There would have been pl some plain stuff um, and and lace work as well. Yeah, that so, would have continued on with hand knitting, but yeah. this was machine knitting. Thing. Yeah. So by the times, yeah, the nineteen sixties came. There would have been hand flat machine knitting, um, and I mean, it really was a mainstay in Shetland at the time. Most houses would have been um, would have been producing or helping to produce okay. knitwear at home. It supplemented their income. Their incomes, absolutely. Yeah. So again, a, a, a need to survive. Um, but this this need or this uh, want for these plain Shetland um, sweaters came in. And that was when my grandfather had the vision or the idea that he wanted to produce a wholly Shetland product. So okay. he really wanted to have a yarn made from our wool, made into a sweater and sent off the islands. So it started to manifest. Um, but it was really that sort of, uh, it really was just an idea until really later in the 1970s when Peter, that's Bertie's son, <laughs> my father, my your husband, husband, your husband <laughs> um, came into the business after he left the school. Um, and it was him and uh, Bertie together that set up the small experimental mill that we put together. Um, it was very, very basic. Um, we had one old card machine, one old spinning frame, and through really just uh, very much homemade equipment, I mean, they would wash wool in a bath and uh, spin it in a domestic dryer, and uh, they had a, a rack that they would lay things out in blast with a uh, gas furnace to, to dry the wool off and add in oil with a, with a, um, a lemonade bottle, if okay. you will. So it really was very much uh, primitive and experimental yeah. at the time. Because we were told that it was uh, really, the Shetland wool was too fragile to be knit, to be spun okay. commercially on right. commercial machinery. But we never believed that. So, but as you can see, we've got a couple of examples here of some of the very, very this first is the yarns. Very first yarn. Yeah, that we wow. actually managed to produce. <laughs> Quite <And> thick. <laughs> yeah, that's what's this, an Aran weight? No, is this, it? no, this is supposed to be jumper weight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But as you can see, it's a bit but lumpy it's and a bobbly. Bit lumpy. And the twist is not maybe just incredibly smooth in it. But this is the original. This is in the museum the, archive. Yes, that is. That <laughs> is or the cupboard upstairs. That's the, <laughs> the oldest, that's the oldest yeah, hank yeah. of yarn we have. Absolutely. Wow. But, I mean, as you can see from the yarn, it became very obvious very quickly that... Um, it's possible. The it was wool possible. was very, very possible to do that. In fact, even the handle of this old stuff here, it's still soft. You've it still is. got that. It uh, is. And, that's, and it's yeah. also 40 years old. Yeah, at least, yeah. So, um, so, so quickly, pr prior to that... What fleece were they using? Were they just... They were taking Shetland fleece, but they would have been blending it with okay. um, heavier English breeds. Okay. Um, they said it was to make the Shetland wool stronger, but we are maybe firmly of the opinion that it was really making the coarser breeds smoother and softer. Ah. They, were, they were telling us one thing, but it was really for, for yeah. the use of the okay. So in the 1970s, of course, the oil industry came to the islands. Um, and with that became much bigger opportunities for the local council to support indigenous industries, but at the same time, new industries as well. Um, and with their help, um, they built the building that we're, we're still in today, the factory, the first factory. Okay. Um, and if it hadn't been for that, we certainly wouldn't be producing yarns like we are today. Um, so in 1981... The year I was born, hmm, yeah. then uh, <laughs> there and thereabouts. I don't remember it, as you could well imagine. Um, we started, the, the building work started here. Um, and a few years previous to that, my father started to travel down to the likes of Yorkshire areas, the Gala Shields, that kind of places, and started to look at um, machinery um, with a, a view of purchasing some of the older, big, heavy 
proper industrial car and machines and spinning frames to take up to, to fill the fill the factory here. Okay. Um, and we're still using all of those machines today. Um, we've replaced one or two, but literally it's just one or so two. So they're about nearly forty years old, aren't well, they? Well, they, and they weren't new when they came here. Okay. No, absolutely <laughs> not. Um, you know, so some yeah. of the machinery in here is very very old. I mean, for example, the the scouring facility we have. Some of that parts is very old. There's one of the squeeze heads is over 100 years old. But it's just a big old lump of cast iron just that turns very yeah. slowly. It's got all new belts, all new motors, all new gearboxes, but the actual framework is still, yeah. is still old. So, um, and then, so moving along, yeah. um, 1985, December 1985, we were very excited that we had the official opening of the factory here. Um, I was only four, so I was probably not just a great just participator in, <laughs> in the in the party. Um, but it was a proud moment for the family. Yeah. Um, it had gone full circle, really had, and a proud moment for sort of the, the textile industry altogether. So... Now we've got this yarn, we're producing a yarn, a good yarn, um, and we very quickly came to realize that we couldn't produce enough. So in 1986, um, we extended the factory. But unfortunately, just on the tail end of us managing to complete that project, um, we had a big downturn in the knitwear industry in the islands, which is what we really wanted to be producing for. So we had to diversify and maybe had to do so quite quickly, I think it would be fair to say. Um, but luckily, we'd already been starting to experiment with other things. But um, through a very useful meeting with a man called David Codlin um, from a company called the Tomato Factory, um, through his help, um, we really pushed forward our, our hand knit yarns to really incorporate most of the, the range we still have today. Yeah. Um, and that was exciting for um, knitwear designers besides. Um, but... That was only one half of what we did. We'd also been experimenting in our knitwear because we'd already um, bought our first computer-controlled knitting machine. So we were doing this type of knitwear that I'm wearing today. We were trying to experiment with machine knit um, fair isles to try and replicate fair isle as much as we mm -hmm. possibly could. Um, and we'd also started our, our small tweed program that we do as well. So we've yeah. got a very small... Um, small amount of, of looms Shetland, here. Yeah. So we do this sort of Shetland tweed as well. But as wow. you can imagine, yeah. it's been a lot of hard work and a lot of late nights, um, but, uh, but enjoyable. Absolutely, so. yeah. So now the mill is do is completing the all of the stages of yarn production, isn't yeah. it? It's doing everything from the raw, greasy fleece straight off the sheep's back to the beautiful uh, coloured and dyed <laughs> yarn and that's been spun up into a ball already and put on with a fresh label. So just really quickly, <laughs> <laughs> give us a rundown of, of the basic process what that in, so from the raw fleece coming in. Okay, so we, yes, as you say, we buy the fleece um, directly from the farmers, the mm -hmm. local crofters as we call them. Um, and the first job is to grade that fleece. Um, so we're only trying to use the best um, Shetland fleece that we can get our hands on. And we're still trying to buy uh, wool from people who have a lot of the Shetland breed of sheep. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of sheep in Shetland which are not Shetland sheep, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I have seen them. Yes. Yeah. Um, so through careful grading, and I do mean careful, we hand grade absolutely every single fleece, uh, we can hopefully weed out those crossbred animal yeah. fleeces um, and take that away and only keep the best best for our own use. But once we get it to a stage where we're happy with it, um, we go on to scour the fleece. Mm -hmm. um, so we put it through what we call the fleece breaker, which is basically a big machine which pulls that fleece apart, mm -hmm. gives it a good shake, try and shake out as much of the of the foreign materials that's in the, in the fleece um, before dumping it into some nice hot water. So basically, nice hot soapy water, three big tanks there, about 50 degrees centigrade. We want to be careful we don't uh, damage the fibre. Um, and as it gets pushed through um, the scouring tanks, uh, that should come out cleaner between each, beneath, between each uh, tank. We dry it out and for storage. Um, but we will use the yarn, uh, the wool as its own colours because we do have the natural colour. But more common, of course, is a dyed, like yeah. what we've got behind yeah. me here. Um, so, yeah, into the dye pot, we have two main dye tanks. One that we go straight onto the wool. We try to use that one as much as we can. Because we're doing a natural product, um, all the wool will take um, the yarn, the, the wool will take the dye slightly differently, sorry. And um, we kind of 
because it's still got a lot of the processing to go through, any imperfections will be almost ironed out. Um, and to the naked eye, you would hardly see it. And then the other type, we use that one for doing onto the clean spawn yarns, um, right onto the skein. So we do that for like bleached whites, bright yellows, baby pastel colors, yeah. that kind of yeah. thing. Because there's not got the opportunity to get dirty as yeah. it passes through yeah. the rest of the factory. Once we've got our wool dyed on the wool, um, we move along to do some color blending. So we're taking three or four different um, colors and we're mixing those together to make something a little bit more interesting than just the plain. Yeah, the or, heathered. Yeah, the heathered yarns. Um, so we're taking maybe two or three or even anything up to maybe seven different colors and mixing those together to give uh, something a little bit more interesting. And this is what our shade card has really become quite yeah. well known for. Yeah. Um, once it's, the wool is kind of mixed together, it's ready for the carding machine. Uh, carding is a very simple process, not changed for, for thousands of years. Uh, we're really just attempting to comb that fleece, yeah. um, to take away any lumps. Um, one of the problems with our old carding machine was it couldn't, it couldn't card enough, but uh, with the big, uh, heavy industrial plant, you can, you can smooth out any imperfections. Uh, as the, car, the wool comes off the end of the carding machine, it's cut into these fine strips and uh, the eccentric motion of the rubbers at the back end creates these pencil rovins um, that are gathered on the on the tubes at the back. It's then on to the spinning. Um, spinning, again, simple process. We're just adding twist. Yeah. But at the same time, we stretch the yarn a little bit. Um, we have to stretch it to um, adjust the final thickness of the, of the yarns to make sure that every individual color comes out the same. We would we would spin everything in a single ply, obviously, yeah. and and the four ply, the twenty one cut as we call it, that is that's the gala count for the single ply. Um, that's our most common. Yes, our, certainly our most common. Mm -hmm. um, but we do another two weights as well. We do the nine cut, um, and that's the one that we make into our iron weights and the bulky, the chunky weight. Um, and then we do a very fine one as well, the the thirty two cut. Um, which is our ultra weight yarn. So we've got that cobweb yarn as the single ply, and then we yes. ply it up to make the two okay. ply. So there's a few more processes after we after we get to that stage. <laughs> but that's a good. That, you can say there's a lot, and you yeah, really know the yeah. business. Well, we, I've had no choice but to learn that. But, yeah, yeah, so have you worked on every every aspect of it? Have you done? Yes, yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah, um, uh, unfortunately, all of us in this building I we. Think we're Pretty multitasked. <laughs> <laughs> it, it depends who falls up on a Monday morning and says, I've got the flu, I can't come in. We have to be able to step into their shoes. Okay. Simple as that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, Elaine, have, I, I saw Gary uh, getting into one of the dye pots and, and pushing the, the yes. fleece down. Have you done that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I can't I've done get lots of other wool. things, but I haven't done that. <laughs> yeah. I can't get her to wash wool either. She seems to say it's too smelly. Okay. But, you know, I thought you should have your gum boots on. He didn't, yeah. have his, he didn't get his feet wet. I don't think they get their feet wet. <laughs> no, no, no. Practice makes perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Lucky. So, what's your favorite? Oh, if you, if that's you had a fantastic to, question. If you had to pick your day, if I had where to pick would you spend day? it? I actually like carding and spinning. Yeah. It's very um, therapeutic. Because yeah. you, you put the wool in and you really it really is where the wool goes from um, wool to a finished article. And it's, it's kind of nice. We also like balling as well. It's kind of fun. You get to see all the colours that, going pretty, through. That's pretty, isn't it? It, <laughs> it is. is. Yeah. And, is and it's, again, it's a finished product. It's taking it for something and moving along to a finished, yeah. finished article. Fantastic. I tend to do twisting, balling, hanking, coning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sort of and ain, the ain things, I think you could see. And it does a lot yeah. of the knitwear stuff as well. Great. So we have to talk about the colour palette now because it's really a designer's dream. There's over 220 colours and they were developed over the last 25 years. As you can see, I'm wearing a Marie Wallen design, which is, um, I'm, I think it uses, I'm not sure, I, I knitted it last year, but I think 16 colours. They all blend so beautifully together. So we need to know about the colour palette. Was there a concept or is there a concept behind the colour palette? Well, it's really sort of come from our, our machine knitting side of things. I've, I've got a few examples of an old shade card here. I mean, that's really where we started back in the 80s. Um, and it very quickly became much bigger, as you can see. <laughs> and then, of course, wow. we move along to our brand new one, which we've just think we've got the naturals here and then all the way onto there. So as you can see, it, it has evolved. But 
unfortunately evolved very quickly and our, our storeroom can hardly keep up but yeah. we need them so we, yeah. we continue to produce these things okay and Elaine has just got a massive bundle of swatches here so Elaine you get so many customers coming in and asking you how to work with colours don't you so I thought we'd just grab a few different colours here and you could just um, tell us typically you know what how you advise them well most people come in and they are looking for quite bright patterns. Now, this is the very first pattern that we made on our commercial computer machines. And those are the colours, which are quite bright. And you wouldn't think they would work together, but as you can see, they do. You can change it very little by adding just grey instead of the murat. So it's practically the same, okay. but it does change it a little. So basically here... The, the main patterns are the same, but the sort of the background of yes, the, the Kiri yep. here's natural uh, murat, which is the brown colour, yes. Shetland brown, and here's natural grey. Yes, yep. yes. Yep. And they, they always say, where do we start? So we would probably start with the base colour, and you can change it very quickly by using a completely different background colour or a different shades. Now, we also have very uh, heathery muted, shades yeah. and muted colours, now, those are muted colours, and that is what it looks like when you get it knitted. Those are easy to blend, and this is the sort of thing you would achieve. Yeah. Much subtler. Yeah, that's because there's always a little bit of almost every colour in the yarn, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. We've yes. Got they they, they, they move into each other. This, these ones are quite close, whereas this is a little bit darker. Yeah. And the purples. Yeah. But then you can change anything that you want by just altering your colours. These and are they, all the same pattern, but they've just got different colours. Um, that's amazing, them, isn't so. it? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay, you can see that. You can see here, for instance, you've used a very plain blue colour as the background, and here you've used more of a heathered colour, and that's got these shades in it, so it yeah. is a more blending effect. Yeah. Yeah. How many colours in this pattern? In this pattern, we have 13 different colours of those. Mm -hmm. So when you're putting together a new Feral design, do you start with the background colours and then put the pops in, or how do you...? Yes, and we can change things very easily on the machine. It's not like studying it when you're knitting by hand, <laughs> but you've got to go all, all the way through your swatch. That's so you can, you can just add the cones to the knitting machines and it will just produce and it will be easy. And within 10 minutes you'll say, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. And then you can do something else. You can introduce a different colour, a darker blue or a black or a green or just something completely different. And it, it does change it drastically, as you can see, because you, you wouldn't think those were the same, that these were all the same pattern, yeah. just using all different colours. Yeah. Yeah. So. But uh, they could change very little, or then they can change a great deal. And depending on your choice, whether yeah. you like bright or do you like subtle. I think more designers need to buy themselves knitting machines so they can experiment. <laughs> They're a tad expensive, <laughs> really. Um, uh, one of the hardest things about a knitting machine, of course, is the program inside of things. It's, yeah. um, to develop a, a Fair Isle program with 13 colours in is really taking these machines to that extreme. Um, so, But it's something we've become known for. So that's one of our um, our selling points. Okay. Lots of colours in our fair house. Yeah, and that's what your yeah. dad likes to do. It's well, it's what he has to do. <laughs> no, it was his no. it was his idea, um, and uh, and he has developed it um, really as far as we possibly can. So, that's great. Yeah, and they also produce woven materials. There's Shetland tweed and Shetland blankets. So. Um, yeah, what is everyone has heard, or most people have heard of Harris tweed? What are the special qualities of Shetland tweed? Well, Shetland tweed's a lot softer. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the great things about our tweed is we are using the the single ply um, twenty one cut yarn that we spoke about a little while ago. Um, so that's the single strand of like our spindrift, for example. Um, but it's quite soft. It's not yeah. really ideal for for tweed. Um, you want something with a lot more twist in there to give it strength. But through careful weaving, really, yeah. uh, we've got to be very careful. We can produce this really nice soft cloth. Yeah. Um, so it's slow to do. 
Um, but at the far side of it, once you actually get it produced, it's got a lovely handle to it. It's really soft. It wears really nice next to the skin. Um, but and it and it kind of keeps the characteristic of the Shetland wool as well. You've got this kind of little bit of hair going on mm -hmm. there, that halo, I suppose, mm -hmm. that some yeah. people speak about. Um, and of course, as you can see from the blanket we have here, the color palette is somewhat of a help as well. So it gives uh, it gives ourselves some some real scope for design. I think you can knit yourself a jumper and make yourself a skirt and it's out of the same <laughs> yarn you could, so you're you going to match. Yes. It's always good. It's, what, just well with your jumper. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you but it's uh, it's warm. You would be warm if you had on a tweed skirt and a, and a, a Shetland wool sweater. You would, be, you would be good for a cold So weather. who are your customers for the, for the tweed? Most, Mostly Italian yes, and Japanese. Yes, traditionally. And yeah. We've also moved into making our own garments. Yes. Just in the yeah, last few years. Yeah. As, as an and avenue of using our tweeds, yes, really, is, more than yeah. anything else. That's a really beautiful cape, isn't it? It's it's somewhat unique. With different styles. Yeah. We've done uh, yeah. slippers, handbags, mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. things using the tweed. Yeah. yeah. Great. And you've got a, a very special weaver, Brian. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Brian, yes. Um, he's... he's probably forgotten more about weaving than, than I shall ever know. He's been in the trade for 40 odd years um, and he would never see himself as a designer although he put all these colours together. Puts, Everything that we yeah. have he's put together. Um, he would just describe himself as a weaver, you know, very yeah. modest man but, uh, but talented. Yeah. It, definitely. So he's yeah. a real gold nugget for you, isn't <laughs> he? He sure yep. is, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you spoke earlier about how the business has evolved over the last hundred years so that you could survive. What are you doing now? How are you managing now to keep the meal modern and relevant to today's market? Well, it's a lot to look after, I think it would be fair <laughs> yeah. to say. Um, we've, we've just got to try and keep going um, with the massive yarn range, the tweed, the knitwear, there's not really much more we can do with with yarns. Um, I'm sure there's probably somebody out there that could suggest something, but uh, we've really just got to try and kind of keep Keep, yeah. the, keep the wheels moving. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you, you're, you're everywhere around, you know, you're, you're known around on all around in the knitting world. So that's, that's I great. I hope and, so. I yeah. mean, one of the things we have done in to try and keep ourselves more current is we put us a uh, computer control um, system into our yarns as they're moving through the factory, just to speed things up, um, to try and keep, uh, as, as we have so many colours, it can be really confusing sometimes where certain things are in that long process that we've yeah. spoken about. So that was an idea just to kind of um, using a barcode system to keep yeah. things moving. Well, I can really see your strong passion for and interest <laughs> in the family business, and I bet your mum and dad are so happy that you've got such an Some emotional, <laughs> <laughs> well, an emotional investment in the business because it is a fifth generation business, and and you're happy and, and excited about continuing it on. But the other thing is, um, a family business is really just a family lifestyle, isn't it? It's not nine to five work. You're probably oh, no. thinking yeah. about it no. all the time. No. So how do you all manage to live and work so closely together and to have done so through multiple generations? Oh, we have tolerance. to get on. Yeah, tolerance. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do get on. We no. get on well. I mean, yeah. I, I left university um, from doing an engineering degree to come home to do this job. It was something that I wasn't pushed into. Yeah. Um, none of our family was. My sister also works in the business full time, um, Louise, and she looks after all of our sort of dispatch side of things, but at the same time just helps us. Um, we often laugh about having board meetings over a cup of coffee, you know, and that really is, as we're packing the van on its way to Lerwick, um, we'll, we'll chat about what needs to be done tomorrow, you know. Yeah. Um, but we do get on reasonably yeah, we well. Yeah. Well, well, I we heard you all went to holiday <laughs> together, so you must. <laughs> Yeah. We did. We went yeah. last year. The whole, all the family, all our, all our children and their families. There were seventeen of us all together. We went to Portugal. Yeah, we had good. three villas together. Yeah, every age from two to sixty-two. Yeah, <laughs> and we had a great time. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we 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 struggle on, but we we managed to keep uh, keep friends. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's a really great story. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us and our viewers. It's it's been really great to hear the inside story. Well, thank you oh, for thank coming. Thank you very much for coming. It's been yes. good having you. Good. Okay. Yes. Well, okay. let's say goodbye to the viewers. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Bye-bye. <Sarah>. <laughs>